Good evening. It is good to have you here tonight, both uh, in the building and for those of you who are able to just now join us online, uh, welcome as well. We've had a little bit of technical difficulty in the back, but we've gotten that resolved and we're expecting the Lord to do some great and amazing things uh, tonight as we open up his word and we study together. Um, tonight I want to remind you though, uh, as we talk and as we discuss and as we listen to, to God's voice that... Um, we are here to take a stand, and we are here to take a stand for Christ. And uh, as we study, uh, a lot of us, uh, I had a, a friend of mine many, many years ago who told me, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. You've probably heard that quote before at some point in time. I'm going to tell you today more than ever, it's more important for us to stand upon the Word of God and stand upon the promises that are found in His Word each and every day. So I want us to sing about that this evening. So let's stand together and let's sing Standing on the Promises this evening as we prepare to study God's Word. Here we go. Standing on the promises of Christ my King Through eternal ages let His praises ring Glory in the highest I will shout and sing Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing, standing I'm standing on the promises of God Standing on the promises that cannot fail When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail By the living word of God I shall prevail Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises of Christ the Lord, bound to Him eternally by love's strong cord. Overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing, standing I'm standing on the promises of God Standing on the promises I cannot fall Listening every moment to the Spirit's call Resting in my Savior as my all in all Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing, standing I'm standing on the promises of God Let's pray together. Father, thank you for tonight. We thank you for an opportunity to gather together. And Lord, your word says, where two or more are gathered, there you will be in our midst. And so, Father, tonight, as we're gathering here together uh, in our building, or we have folks who are gathering together online, we are excited about you being in our midst. But, Father, with that also comes some great responsibility on our part and that you're in our midst so we should be still enough to be able to listen to your voice we should be still enough to be able to not only listen but then be obedient to what it is you've called us to do and so every time we open up your word and every time we hear about these promises that we've just sung about and every time then we are challenged in our own walk in our daily life may we remember those opportunities where you spoke to us and where uh, your word shared uh, truths that we need to live by, and may we find comfort in those. May we find strength in those when uh, circumstances call for it. May we find a joy in reading and standing on the promises from, of your word. Lord, we do thank you again for the opportunity you've given us to break that open tonight, and I pray that your spirit would speak loud and clear to us. In thy name we pray. Amen.
Thank you, Derek, and good evening to you. If you have your Bibles, please open to Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13, as we talk about our topic of this evening, which will be about Christian self-defense. And if Christians, according to the Word of God, have a right of self-defense to defend ourselves, regardless of what's coming our way uh, in our changing culture. Um, and again, on Wednesday nights, uh, we normally do topics that people... Uh, either call me or send me an email or text or, or some kind of message. And uh, I've been blessed. I just want y'all to know that. Uh, I probably got two months worth now already in front. Of <laughs> so y'all can hold up a minute. Now, now, uh, now still, if you have a, a topic that you'd love to have discussed, because we are living in changing times, and it's tough living holy in an unholy world. And sometimes you say, well, this particular thing that's coming up, what does God's Word have to say about how we should conduct ourselves? And so that's what we try to go to the Word of God and find answers to. Uh, but tonight we have uh, uh, been asked to study Christian self-defense. Uh, I received a, a question from an online viewer who uh, was concerned about what appears to be a growing anti-Christian sentiment in our country. Uh, if you study a little history, you'll note that in the early days of our country, the United States was considered to be a Christian nation. Not that everybody was a Christian, but that most people knew who Jesus was, knew about the Bible, and our laws and all were based uh, upon the Scripture. And so we were considered a Christian nation. But in the last few decades, uh, things have shifted, and some of the government leaders are viewing Christians uh, as possible uh, domestic terrorists. I uh, read an example that happened just a, a couple of weeks ago now, on January 23rd, uh, Tulsi Gabbard, who was a former Democrat U.S. representative from Hawaii and also a former Democratic candidate for President of the United States in the 2020 election. Uh, in an interview with uh, Fox News with Brian Kilmeade, she expressed concern that a proposed law to combat domestic terrorism could be used to undermine civil liberties of many people. Uh, the Domestic Terrorism Prevention Act of 2021 I went to look it up, and they said the text is not yet available. My guess is somebody knows what the text is, but for us little people, we're not supposed to know what it is yet. Uh, but anyhow, it was introduced in the House of Representatives on January the 19th. Uh, Representative Gabbard said that her concern lies in how officials will define the characteristics that they are searching for in identifying potential domestic terrorists. She said, when you have people like former CIA director John Brennan openly talking about how he's spoken with or heard from appointees and nominees in the Biden administration who have already started to look across our country for these type of movements that, in his words, he says, make up this unholy alliance of religious extremists, racist bigots, he lists a few others, and at the end included even libertarians. Representative Gabbard said, what characteristics are we looking for as we build this profile for a potential extremist? What are we talking about? When we say religious extremist, are we talking about Christians? Are we talking about evangelical Christians? What is a religious extremist? Is it somebody who is pro-life? Where do you take this? Gabbard said the proposed legislation, which since she's a representative, she probably knows what is in the text, which you and I do not yet know, she said, a very dangerous undermining of our civil liberties, our freedoms, and our Constitution, and a targeting of almost half of the country. Well, not only is Tulsi Gabbard concerned, many Christians are also concerned as well. Several of our members uh, here locally and also our online viewers have asked, uh, what are Christians supposed to do if the government begins viewing Christians as domestic terrorists or enemies of the state? Do Christians have a right to self-defense? Are Christians allowed to de defend themselves uh, and their families? So, um, again, what are we supposed to do with that? And, of course, most people always quote what you have open in front of you, Romans chapter 13, and we'll read verses 1 through 7, which is what a lot of people say, that we just uh, have to tolerate whatever the government throws at us because of Romans chapter 13. So that's what we're going to look at. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, 
and you will have praise from the same, the government. For he is God's minister to you for good, but if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister and an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore you must be subject, not only because of wrath, but also for your conscience' sake. For because of this you also pay taxes, for they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Therefore render to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs due, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. And of course you've got to remember uh, who was the guy in charge of the Roman Empire when Romans was written? Nero. I can't imagine a more worthless leader to ever sit on a throne in the history of the world than Nero, but here uh, Paul, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, tells us to be subject to the government. So what are we supposed to do with this? Well, of course, I put the poll out this week. For those of you who went to the poll, uh, do Christians have the right to self-defense? 94% of you said yes. 2% said no. And got 4% out there still undecided until I get through explaining it tonight. And I'm sure... <laughs> They will change their mind. But anyway, if you've uh, been paying attention to the news at all, uh, it should be obvious that there is an anti-Christian sentiment or attitude developing in our country. Uh, National Public Radio uh, online website from November 8th, right after the election, said that about 80% of evangelical Christians voted for Trump. And what is an evangelical? An evangelical is a Christian who believes that the Bible is God's word, that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven, and that you must be born again in order to see the kingdom of heaven. For the most part, most all evangelicals are pro-life, and also they're evangelistic. We're supposed to tell other people about how they can have faith in Jesus Christ. Well, the problem is, is after the election, many Democrat politicians are viewing evangelicals as potential domestic terrorists. And they're in the process of writing this legislation that we just talked about um, to put these pro-life evangelicals under surveillance uh, to make sure that we do not threaten the current government or foment a civil war. So bottom line is, if you're an evangelical Christian, there's a high probability you voted for Trump and therefore you're an enemy of the state. So yes, there is a reason for Christians to be informed and also concerned about the current political situation in the United States. And to answer the other question, the answer is yes, Christians do have a right to self-defense. Even from Old Testament times in Exodus chapter 22 and verse 2, it says, If a thief is found breaking in and he is struck so that he dies, there shall be no guilt for his bloodshed. In other words, what they were saying there is if you're in your home at night and somebody's trying to break in and you don't know what they're going to do if they break in whether they're there to steal or if they're there to harm your family or whatever so if you get up and defend your life your family your property then under the old testament law uh, then you would not be prosecuted for that uh, because you have a right to self-defense also under the old testament law in leviticus chapter 24 and verse 19 there's something called the law of proportional retaliation and it reads as follows, If a man causes disfigurement of his neighbor, as he has done, so shall it be done to him. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, as he has caused disfigurement of a man, so shall it be done to him. Deuteronomy chapter 19 verse 2 adds life for life. In other words, if you kill somebody, uh, then uh, your life should be taken. And of course, this eye for eye, tooth for tooth thing sounds very cruel, uh, but actually it was more civilized than the law before uh, Moses penned this under inspiration from the Lord. If you remember back in Genesis chapter 4, verse 23, there's a guy named Lamech. And Lamech said to his wives, Alda and Zala, Hear my voice, you wives of Lamech, hearpen to my speech. For I have slain a man to my wounding and a young man to my hurt. In other words, a guy hurt me and so I killed him. And he goes ahead and says... If Cain can be avenged sevenfold, surely Lamech 70 times sevenfold. And that's kind of what you call overkill. That's what you call the law of the jungle. Uh, so back before the Old Testament law where we had eye for eye, tooth for tooth, uh, basically anybody that offended me could get the death penalty. I could kill somebody for hurting me. So again, when you get to Moses, seems cruel to us by today's standards in the judicial system anyway, um, but back then, that was actually a taming of things, uh, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, instead of 
killing anybody who offends me. So it was called lex talionis in Latin, the law of proportional retaliation. In other words, you should make the punishment fit the crime. And then we get to the New Testament. And Jesus gives us a more merciful and gracious ethic to go with. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 38 says, You have heard it is said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for tooth. But I tell you, resist not an evil person. Whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other cheek to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. Whoever compels you to go a mile, go with him too. We talked about that a few weeks ago. Give to him who asks you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the sons of your Father who is in heaven. So Jesus is not disagreeing with the Old Testament. Matter of fact, he said he didn't come to set aside the Old Testament. He came to fulfill it. Uh, he says, of course, that you have the right to self-defense and retaliation. But he goes on here to say retaliation, though, should not be your first response. It should be your last resort. People of God first response should always be to show love and mercy forgiveness and to seek peace because think about it if everybody lived for our legal rights and retaliation if we all live for eye for eye tooth for tooth i think we would live in a society full of eyeless and toothless people uh, because if every, everybody who offended me then i turned around and offended them in return uh, we would have a pretty good mess in society and that's what jesus was talking about and I think the apostles picked up on this uh, and understood the meaning of Christ. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 17, it says, Repay no one evil for evil. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Notice how he drug that out. He's not saying this is not going to be easy. How easy is it to live peacefully with everybody? It's hard. But anyhow, he goes, if it is possible, as much as lies, in other words, as much as lies on your part, then try to get along with everybody. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. So we trust the Lord to avenge us. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him drink. For in so doing, you shall heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. And, of course, I know a lot of people say, yeah, I'd love to heap some coals of fire <laughs> on, the, on the head. But that's not what that means at all. Um, that's, a, that's an oriental expression. Uh, I saw it when I was serving in Korea. I understand, you know, that, that was the way it was in the Middle East back in the day. Uh, but you didn't have lighters. You didn't have matches. You didn't have a ready source of fire. Fire was very important. Kept you from freezing at night, enabled you to boil water and make your meals and all that sort of thing. So everybody needed fire. But every now and then your fire would go out. And that's what it's saying. What happens if your enemy's fire goes out and needs some coals? Well, you're supposed to heap some coals of fire on his head. What does that mean? Well, in the Orient, I'd see the ladies coming down the street. They'd have this little ring of cloth on top of their head, and they would have a pan. They carried everything on their head. And so you would put coals in that pan, and she would put it on her head, and she would take it home, and she'd put those coals in her fire, and she'd start the fire. So what it's saying, even if your enemy's coals go out, don't be stingy. Don't say, well, I finally get even where you go home and freeze. No, that's not what Christians are supposed to do. We're supposed to heap coals of fire on them. Help them start their fire. Help out your neighbor when they're in a tough spot, even if it ends up being somebody who has shown themselves to be your enemy. So, according to the Scripture, we have a right to self-defense, but for Christians, we're called to peacefully live with all people and use retaliation only as a last resort. But I really don't think that's what the question was about that they were asking me. I think the question was, is how long should Christians tolerate a government if it becomes increasingly hostile to Christianity? What we're asking is, when is it justifiable for Christians to either pa uh, practice passive resistance or actively take up arms against a tyrannical government? What you're asking is, when is it okay for Christians to go to war? whenever our rights are being violated. Well, Christian ethicists divide the issue of war into three positions, and generally in the whole Christian community, you'll, you're going to find one of these three positions. One of those is being a pacifist. Some Christians uh, read passages of Scripture, like I just read a few moments ago from Matthew 5, and decide that all killing is wrong, that all resistance is evil, 
and no good comes from war even wars fought for good causes end up going evil and if you ever studied any warfare that's probably a true statement and of course they quote Romans 13 that we read to start with and said you know we're supposed to uh, uh, tolerate our government get along as best you can and not resist the government matter of fact if you go back and study pre-world war ii you'll find german christians use romans 13 to justify uh, their blind obedience to adolf hitler and the nazis matter of fact there was a german preacher who at some point realized that hitler was on the wrong track and he had to be done away with a guy named dietrich bonhoeffer he struggled with romans 13 uh, trying to take that very literal, but he decided after a matter of time when he heard all that was happening under Adolf Hitler that he needed to be opposed. And so he opposed Hitler, and for that he paid for it with his life. He was arrested and he was hanged in a concentration camp. But pacifists say that government is ordained by God, even evil governments, so try your best to comply. And again, Nero was in charge when the Apostle Paul uh, wrote that we uh, Romans chapter 13 and Nero was also the Caesar uh, whenever he wrote 1st Timothy chapter 2 where he said pray for kings and all those who are in authority that we might live peaceful lives so pacifists some people think that there's no reason to ever resist or to go to war or, or to defend yourself and there's a number of groups out there uh, who, who feel that way on the other extreme is something called activist. Some Christians believe it's always right to fight for a good cause, and they quote things like Matthew 10, 34. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth, Jesus said. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. They also read Luke 22, 35. Just before Jesus went to the cross, he said to his disciples, When I sent you out with a, without a money bag or knapsack or sandals, did you lack anything? And they said, No, nothing. Then he said to them, But now he who has a money bag, let him take it. Likewise, he who has a knapsack, and he who has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. And of course, what Jesus is saying there is while Jesus was here on earth, he had kept his disciples safe, but now that he's going to the cross and fixing to leave and go to back to his heavenly Father, uh, they were probably going to need some self-defense. So buy a sword uh, for self-defense. So you got two opposing groups here of Christians. Some are pacifists who think you shouldn't fight under any circumstances. And then you've got uh, activists who believe that any good cause is a good reason to fight. And of course, the third position would be what? Somewhere in the middle. And that's called selectivist. Uh, somewhere in the middle between pacifists who don't believe you should ever fight and activists who think you ought to go to war to drop of a hat. Uh, I like the way President Reagan uh, said it. Uh, he said, in Washington, there are three positions on war. There are hawks who are for war. There are doves who are for peace. I personally believe in being a heavily armed dove. And so I guess that's what that, that's, that's what that middle position is, where you really don't want to go to war, but if it ends up needing war to deter evil from happening, then that's what he's prepared to do. So what is this? selectivist position what is this heavily armed dove well it goes all the way back to the early church fathers you probably heard of augustine you may have heard him called saint augustine we have a city named uh, after him in florida uh, but he developed a position called the just war theory and by just i mean righteous uh, what does it mean to fight a righteous war and that's called just war and he came up with this not in the ivory towers uh of a philosophy department at some university augustine was actually the senior pastor of the city of hippo in algeria when the city was under siege by the vandals and augustine actually died during that siege so again this was not just a textbook exercise where he said oh, i wonder what he means no he actually had the enemy at the gate they were at the wall is when he came up with what does it mean to be able to fight a just war um, and his first position was, is a war in defense of the innocent is just. In other words, if there's some innocent person out there that's being abused, uh, then you have a right to defend them. Um, for example, in Genesis chapter 14, if you'll remember, Abraham uh, had a nephew named Lot who chose to move down into the plains of Sodom and Gomorrah. And before, they were all blown away. But anyhow, he was down there and had all these neighbors 
and some a bunch of kings known as kings of the valley chose to invade and so they invaded the valley down there and they captured Abraham's nephew Lot and all of his neighbors they were attacked they were robbed and then they were kidnapped and carried away and if you'll remember Abraham had about 300 servants who carried arms and so they got on their horses and they went up there and uh, routed the enemy and brought Lot and all of his neighbors back uh, and so you, that's a similar rationale as self-defense. You're allowed to kill in order to protect your family and your friends. Uh, again, that's old, coming from the Old Testament, but a war in defense of justice or, or the innocent is considered a just war. Uh, also, if you do a little word study, I know a lot of people say, well, the Bible says thou shalt not kill. Um, and so therefore killing under any circumstances is breaking of the law, but that's not exactly the case there's a couple of Hebrew words in play here. There's one called harak, which means to slay. Uh, Thou shalt not kill, slay. But actually, when you're looking at the Ten Commandments and you look at that Sixth Commandment, it actually says, Thou shalt not rotsak, which means murder. So that if you've got a new King James, it says, Thou shalt not murder. I think the old King James says, Thou shalt not kill. Murder is actually the best translation because even if you study Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy, you'll find the Old Testament law makes exceptions for killing and self-defense and capital punishment and also war. Um, and when it comes to defense of the innocent, uh, Americans use this rationale in World War I, World War II, the Cold War, Kuwait, uh, as we were going over there to help out defenseless innocent people. Of course, the same thing had been said about Rwanda and Sudan, and we didn't go over there. So I guess it depends on if America has a dog in the fight, <laughs> or if it's a national interest, that goes into it as well. But nevertheless, that's the rationale. Uh, the second element of a just war is a war must be fought to execute justice uh, in order to be just. And we got the story in Judges chapter 19 and 20, if you'll remember, the tribe of Benjamin uh, had given themselves over to all sorts of sexual immorality and perversion. And the other 11 tribes gathered together for war in order to put away evil from the nation. So um, Augustine used that example as wars can be justly fought to punish evil doers. And see, that's the same rationale behind capital punishment. You can have capital punishment for capital crimes. Of course, the top capital crime is murder. And so if you kill murderers, that tends to deter heinous crimes from multiplying in, in your nation. And, of course, that's one of the problems we have in our nation now is very few states actually do that anymore, so you tend to have murderers multiply because they know that they don't face any punishment. The third element of just war is a war must be fought by a government in order to be just. And, of course, Augustine got that from Romans chapter 13 that we read at the beginning, and that is it's unjust for people to take the law into their own hands. In order to have a just war, it needs to be organized by a human government. Um, and, of course, then that begs the question, well, was the American Revolution a just war? Well, I'm sure the Americans, uh, the colonists, thought that their Continental Congress was a government. But I'm also equally sure that the British thought it was just a rebellion. But nevertheless, they didn't just go out and take up arms on their own. They had a deliberative act, and they actually used the governments as they had been established in the colonies in order to um, execute the American Revolution. And fourth and finally, Augustine said, a war must be fought justly in order to be just. And of course, uh, I'm sure the Bible verse from that is the golden rule, Matthew 7, 24, do unto others you would have them do unto you. Uh, so even if it's a just war, you're not allowed to torture or, or starve prisoners. You're not allowed to kill non-combatants like innocent and unarmed women and children. Also, it's not considered just to strip the land of its ability to produce food after the war is over. In ancient times, what would happen is in order to punish the people who they'd fought, they'd sometimes bring in salt and salt the land so that the crops would never grow again. Another example of that in modern warfare is if you go in and you use landmines, then you need to dig up those landmines when the war is over. You don't leave those to blow up children in the future. So if you do that, even if it was a just war, it's unjust the way you left the land. And another thing, this has to do with the eye for eye, tooth for tooth rule, and that is use minimal force to secure the victory. Use limited war instead of total war. 
I for I means that you do not use nuclear holocaust for I. In other words, you don't overkill. You use whatever necessary force to end the enemy's uh, aggression, and then you call it a day. You don't go back and blow them up just for the fun of it. So you let the punishment fit the crime. So you got those four principles there on whether to decide to go to war or not. But now the next question is, is what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do in a situation like this where you've got a government uh, that may be fixing to turn on Christians? Maybe we hope and pray not, but that seems to be some of the attitude right now in Washington. What would Jesus do? Well, again, in the Old Testament, there's plenty of examples of going to war, but what of the New Testament? Some people seem to think that Jesus was a pacifist, that he was a teacher of nonviolence. But in the context, uh, if you look at what Jesus did in his time, you've got to remember, he was living in a world that was dominated by a superpower, and that was Rome. Rome owned everything at that particular point. Judea, where Jesus lived, uh, was actually an occupied territory. It was not an independent state. You also have to remember that Jesus was not a judge. He was not a military leader. He was not a politician. He came as an ordinary man to teach ordinary men and women how to live at peace with themselves and how to live at peace with God. So yes, he taught us that it's God's perfect will for us to love one another and try to get along and turn the other cheek. And if somebody pokes you in the eye, you don't have to poke them in the eye. You know, Try to get along out there as best you can. That's what Jesus was teaching. So he taught us that that was the Lord's will. But his cross reminds us that the human condition is constantly involved in spiritual warfare. There's always a warfare between God and the forces of good and Satan and the forces of evil. And far too often our spiritual wars end up linking into physical wars where you're actually shooting or trying to kill each other. And it's true that Jesus was never drafted. He never went to basic training. He didn't put on a uniform. And of course the reason was is he was born during a time called the Pax Romana or the Peace of Rome where again, the Romans had dominated everything and nobody was fighting, or if they did, the Romans would put them to death. So it was a peaceful time in the world. But, uh, what, but even in the midst of that peace, Jesus still lived in a spiritual warfare uh, that ultimately took him to the cross, and he died on the cross for our sins. And the third day he arose victorious over sin, death, and hell, and offered salvation and peace with God and eternal life to all who would put their faith and trust in him. And that's what Jesus did at the first coming. Why? Because at the first coming, he was the Prince of Peace. But there's a second coming. At second coming, Jesus is coming in a different role. He is coming as a warrior, riding the white horse. The Bible tells us, if you paid attention to our Revelation series, that in the last days, Israel will be surrounded by enemies, as it is today, and the order will be given by the United Nations, or whoever the great world power is at the time, to destroy Israel, and Lord Jesus will appear in the clouds uh, with all the armies of heaven, including you, if you are a Christian, and he will win the mother of all battles known as the Battle of Armageddon, where the blood of the Lord's enemies will flow up to the horse's bridle, it says in the book of Revelation. And there will come a time when Jesus, the righteous judge, will retaliate for all the evil of all the ages. So Jesus is not a pacifist. But during the present time, he is, in fact, merciful, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance and be saved. Now, to, to conclude, let's move back to the American Revolution, because if our government continues to try to pass laws that identify Christians as domestic terrorists, and Christians decide to retaliate, what you are talking about is a second American Revolution. And before we do that one, we need to ask, was the first American Revolution justified. And I think so. If you go back and look, after 10 years of negotiation, trying to make peace with the British, King George, Americans chose to fight a defensive war. They called it a defensive war because they said Britain had been on the offense. They had been sending over troops that were occupying our cities, and we had to provide housing and food for them. We had called an occupying army. Uh, they blockaded our seaports and would not allow any trade coming in and out of uh, our ports except uh, what the British wanted to bring us. And also there was this idea of taxation without representation. They just kept uh, adding more taxes uh, to whatever you were doing for a living. You weren't able to clear any money on it. And then the Declaration of Independence, it lists over 30 charges 
uh, and the documentation of how they had tried to handle this through the courts on their way to ultimately to the king and hadn't met with any success. In other words, what they're trying to explain is this war was a last resort. It was not a first response. They'd been 10 years trying to work out something with the king of England, and he refused to negotiate with them at all. But, on the, but to prove that our leaders understood what the cost was is the last clause, the last sentence of the Declaration of Independence. It says, And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually prayed, pledge to each other our lives, our fortune, and our sacred honor. Signed by 56 men, 56 signers of Declaration of Independence. Now, you may have read on Snopes or something that uh, the details were exaggerated, but make no mistake, those 56 guys all had to pay the price. Some of them died personally. Some of them, their children died during the Revolutionary War. Some of them their, lost their lands. Their houses were burned. Uh, all kinds of things happened to these folks here. And that's one thing I think that I kind of get the perception when I get questions, and I get a bunch of them in email about, I get the idea that we want to stand up, stand up for Jesus and fight for our rights as Christians, but Brother Danny, tell us how we can do that, and it won't cost us nothing. I don't know how, I can't make that promise. You study history, you study the Bible, and every time somebody stood up for the Lord, you've got to count on the fact that you're going to take a hit. So I can't guarantee you that if that's what you're looking for. Yes, as Christians, we've got to stand up for what we believe. But we also got to be have our eyes wide open just like these 56 signers did and know that it may cost us our lives. It may cost us our fortunes. It may cost us our sacred honor to stand up, stand up for Jesus. And they were willing to do that. And guess what? You and I have enjoyed the benefits for 245 years. And very rarely does freedom last that long without somebody having to stand up and make another installment. And that's what the American soldiers have done through the years is they made installments to keep the peace. And the question is, is what's this next one going to look like? Now, with all that background, at this point, would it be a biblical justified war to rise up against the encroaching tyranny of the U.S. government? What do you need? What, what is a prerequisite? Well, for our forefathers, uh, it was taxation without representation. That's all it took. They'd had enough. They were being robbed. But look about our situation now and see if we have any complaints about the government that might be above. I mean, we've got taxation with representation, and it ain't all that hot, I can tell you. <laughs> but look at some of the other things that's going on. You've got uh, government uh, intelligence community. Uh, we got folks who are monitoring and censoring our phone calls, emails, social media, smart appliances. You remember General Petraeus, who later became the CIA director? He said in an interview, we're going to spy on you through your dishwasher. What was he talking about? I'll tell you what he's talking about. It's called the Internet of Things. We don't realize it, but just about everything in your life now that's electronic has the ability to spy on you. And as we, if you do a little study on 5G that's coming out now, it's going to only enhance that at higher speeds than ever before. So yes, we have no privacy left. Also, we got the government with satellites and drones that watch everything we do from the skies. You have the Internal Revenue Service. We're targeting conservatives and Christian groups back during the President Obama and Vice President Biden administration. How many of you think that may change with a Biden presidency? especially since he's using the same staff that was in the, Obiden, uh, the Obama administration. Also, you got the government, uh, who's the one who stands behind in uh, uh, public education. And public education has an anti-Christian bias. How many of you knew that? Amen. For the last 60 years, 60 years, I'm 65, pretty close to 60 years, because when I went to school, it was a year they took prayer out of school. Bible reading and that sort of thing. And just think how school has changed. For the last 60 years, uh, they taught evolution but could not teach creation. You could study Allah, but you could not study the Lord God of the Bible. You could discuss Karl Marx, but not Jesus Christ. You could read the Communist Manifesto on the accelerated reading list, but you could not read the Bible. And now we wonder why over 50% of the American population voted for socialism in the last election. I think I know why. You got the government forcing the nation into universal socialized medicine with a complete data mining capability. 
so everybody will know everything about everybody because all of our medical records will be uh, jammed together into one place and cataloged. You got governments forcing businesses to accept, promote, even pay for abortion, gay marriage, sex change operation, diversity training, even vaccines for a new virus that originated in communist China. Meanwhile, our current administration is in the process of rebuilding ties with the Chinese Communist Party, even to the point of allowing the Chinese Air Force to carry out a simulated attack on the United States aircraft carrier Theodore Roosevelt and its strike group as they entered the South China Sea last Saturday. Did y'all hear that? When I used to be in the military, that would be called an act of war. Now it's called okay. Yeah, they were simulating using anti-ship missiles against the aircraft carrier Theodore Roosevelt. And first of all, it wasn't carried in our media. The way I found is military websites and also the British BBC and some of those reported, but none of our, uh, none of our uh, mainstream media carried the thing. And I don't know, I reckon we're just playing with, I, I've said it before, I'll say it again, whether it's Chinese socialism or whether it's American Democrat socialism, Christianity and socialism are incompatible. They will not work together for one simple reason. For all Christians, Jesus is Lord. And for socialists, the state is, war, uh, is Lord, the government is Lord. And when you try to mix those two together, it does not work. So what is a Christian supposed to do? How many of y'all are ready this night to take on the current world superpower, which is the United States of America? Any volunteers? And if I say, why not? It's because the superpower will crush us like a bug, okay? That's a similar situation to what the Romans would have done to the early church if they'd have tried to attack the government, which is why you read Romans 13 the way it reads, and you read what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5. That's why Jesus said, Love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the sons of your Father in heaven. If it's possible, as much depends on you, live peacefully all men. Why? Because you really ain't got no choice. But suppose at a future date, the persecution does become unbearable and a confrontation is forced upon us and you must stand up, stand up for Jesus and defend your faith and your family. What are we supposed to do? Well, here's what Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, verse 11. Now, when they bring you before the magistrates and authorities, read that as government, when they bring you before the government, do not worry about how or what you will answer or what you will say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. And that's what we need to be doing right now as Christians, praying and asking the Holy Spirit for guidance on what to say and what to do and when to retreat and run and when to stand and fight or when to resist or when to surrender. I got to tell you, I don't think there's much history study being done in schools today, so I don't think people have a very deep uh, historical background, but if you'll study biblical history or you study secular history, there have been times when the Lord blessed his people with victory and war, even if they were the minority. But there's also been times, other times, when God's people were in the minority and they end up suffering persecution and even martyrdom. So, no, I can't guarantee you that if you resist, if a government uh, decides to call us domestic terrorists and take action again, uh, against us, I cannot guarantee you that there won't be pain. But we will not be the first generation that's had to deal with that. Ever since there's been a church, people have had to do that for standing for the Lord. And again, sometimes the Lord comes through and gloriously rescues us, but other times... You become martyr. And what was it the uh, early church father Tertullian said? The blood of martyrs is the seed of the church. Many of dictators tried to put the church out of business, but guess what? It only grows stronger whenever they put pressure on us. So just ask the Lord. Say, give me right now. I'd be scared to death. Know what I would say if I was brought in front of the government and had to stand up for my faith. And what does Jesus say? Don't worry about that. Pray and rely on the Holy Spirit. And when the time comes... He will give you grace to say what you need to say 
and do what you need to do. So, whatever our situation, pray in our spiritual battles and ask the Lord to give us strength and courage to be faithful to Him all the way to the end, regardless. Regardless. So no, I can't give you a guarantee that if you stand for Jesus, everything's going to pan out fine. But I can tell you that the Lord will not fail you or forsake you. And even if they end up taking us in this life, what do we have the promise through our Lord Jesus Christ that he rose again and so shall we. And because he lives, therefore we shall live. So take heart, folks. Trust upon the Holy Spirit. And he'll let you know when to do it, how to do it, and why to do it, and when to do it. So uh, that's my advice to you. I wish I could tell you, yes, I've got a plan for you, and it's going to be painless, and you're going to stand up for Jesus, and you're going to look like a hero, and, you know, and then everybody goes to the restaurant after it's over. But that, 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 has, that has not been the history in the past. So again, uh, let's just make our peace with the Lord and make sure we're ready for whatever happens. Amen? Amen. All right, well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, that uh, your word does prepare us for every situation we face if we'll only get into your word. Sometimes there's not a specific thing that tells us exactly what to do, but your word is filled with principles to give us guidance by the Holy Spirit who inspired that word and by the Holy Spirit who illuminates that word so that we can understand it and apply it to our lives. Lord, I thank you for the folks who are here tonight and those who are watching online as we do live in troubled times. Lord, just help us to be faithful till you come. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.